Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them. I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Lawrence Schiller, photographer, movie director, movie producer, author, deal maker, researcher, communicator, someone who has been connected to the biggest names at the center of the biggest news events of the past 60 years. Think in terms of John Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, Lenny Bruce, Norman Mailer, the, the notorious murderer Gary Gilmore, uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, Jean Benet Ramsey. He collaborated with Norman Mailer, uh, somebody who's been featured on this program in the past. Not not Norman in person, but uh, uh, one of his uh, followers. Um, he collaborated with Norman on. The Executioner's Song, which won the Pulitzer Prize, it was labeled as a true true life novel, and that was about the uh, the, the life and times and, and uh, ignominious death of Gary Gilmore. He also collaborated with Albert Goldman on the book Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce. His 11th book is titled Marilyn and Me, A Photographer's Memories. Uh, he also wrote the uh, best-selling books American Tragedy, which is a book about the uh, in, inside the defense of O.J. Simpson, the, the O.J. Simpson case, uh, which was so that dragged on for so long and was so uh, uh, notorious here in the United States. Uh, there was also the book Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, about the killing of Jean Benet Ramsey. And in the 1980s, 1990s, he directed several. Well, actually seven, to be precise, motion pictures and miniseries for television. The Executioner Song was one of them. Peter the Great uh, also. He won five Emmy Awards, including uh, Best Miniseries. And uh, the book's American Tragedy, again, about the O.J. Simpson case and uh, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, uh, as well as the book Into the Mirror, the life of spy of master spy Robert P. Hansen were also made into TV miniseries. Uh, and, and just coming full circle, his photographs of Marilyn Monroe and from the Kennedy assassination are among the most iconic ever captured. Uh, Lawrence Schiller, welcome to the program. Thank you very, very much. Hearing your introduction, I'm trying to remember if I ever met the guy. Uh, which which guy's that? Well, Lawrence Schiller, you know. Oh. <laughs> oh, because, I, 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 because yeah. you know, when you're 16 years old going on 87, you you kind of look back and you say, now, who is that guy? You know, I know that in early part of my life, antisocial behavior kind of interested me. Uh, and, uh, you know, and you've seen plenty of that over the years. then. yeah, well, there, there's a reason why I am involved in a lot of collaborations, which we can get into a little later. Well, the um, let me start with the, you know, it, it, uh, photography, it appears to me was the tip of the spear that opened up this far broader career for you. Uh, do you see yourself first and foremost as a photographer or a motion picture director, an author? What would you say? Well, I don't think I'm technically really any of them, but I dabbed in them. So let, let's start this, this way. When I was in uh, junior high school, I started to get D minuses and Fs in my classes. And I didn't realize, but at that time, I realized that I could not read very well. And I had a very hard time keeping up and with the classes and reading and this and that. Uh, and in junior high school, I was more interested in the debating team arguing why I was getting D's and F's. Well, I'd asked my mother, and, and uh, who cared a lot, 
And she said, well, you know, maybe you don't have the right teachers. Some people learn more of this. Of course, in those days, the word dyslexia didn't exist. And it wasn't until 50 years later that I was actually diagnosed with having dyslexia my entire life. So I started a, in junior high school after my father had given me a camera for my bar mitzvah when I was 12. I started to take pictures of athletes, sporting events, uh, the high school I went to, La Jolla High School. And I started submitting these pictures to the La Jolla Light newspaper and, you know, getting them published. I had uh, Monty Upshaw's uh, record of breaking Jesse Owens' 23-year record in this hop, skip, and the jump and made a very, very fine picture. And there were a lot of athletes going to school about the same time I was. Some just graduated high school. Mo Conley was a tennis player, uh, was playing Wimbledon in the Nationals. Uh, Florence Chadwick had just, a woman had just swam the English Channel, the first woman to ever do so. Gene Littler was a great golfer that had just won the big tournaments. Uh, and I started photographing all of these athletes, which allowed me to travel a little bit uh, on weekends and go places when sporting events took place. My mother was very, very much weather wired, uh, worried. So she'd send my brother along as a chaperone. You know, she thought two of us, well, only one could get in trouble. But nevertheless, I started taking sports pictures and entering photographic contests. And I won the Graflex uh, awards, several awards, second, third, fourth, fifth, and ninth place one year. And I won the William Randolph Hearst Scholastic Sports Association scholarship, which gave me a four-year scholarship uh, to virtually any university I wanted to go to, uh, tuition, room, and board, all because of my photography. And because of my photography, I had uh, seven universities that offered me scholarships besides the Scholastic Art Awards. Uh, I had scholarships to MIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, but with a D minus average coming out of high school, none of them would accept me except Pepperdine on the, the William Randolph Hearst. So that's how I wound up at Pepperdine College in Los Angeles. Still only going to class on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and they'd get mad at me if I'd miss Bible study because it was a very religious school and I was maybe the only Jewish undergraduate there at the time. Uh, and uh, I'd go off on Friday to photograph high school sports somewhere in the United States, Saturday or Sunday, the pros, you know. Uh, and I started working for a sport magazine. I wanted to work for other magazines and I'd send them all these great ideas and I get back all these rejection letters. And I remember pinning them one time up on the wall of my bathroom. So if I sat on the water closet in the toilet, I could read all these letters in front of me. And I finally discovered why I was getting all the rejections. I was getting all the rejections because I was kind of like telling people, well, I'm only 18 years old and I'm going to college and these, you know, I started sending the same letters almost to the same publications without mentioning that I was in college and I was 18 years old. And I started to get assignments from Paris Match in France and all these magazines. I started to work for Look Magazine and for Life Magazine. Eventually they'd find out very quickly how old I was, but by then they'd seen my work and they'd either put that aside or, you know, I remember one publication wanted to know my parents' name and address so they could send them the check because I was still underage, you see. So that's how I got involved in photography. And what I discovered in photography, it was more like monkey see, monkey do. What I'm saying is all the photographers are together shooting. You know, all the photographers at a news event are chasing the same way. 
and I tried to figure out how would I be different than those photographers. And that's what moved me into the business side of photography. And that was the word exclusivity. And how do you gain exclusivity to a story or a subject? How do you get to them first before everybody else does or get to them at a point in which nobody else can get to them? And I, over the years, devised different methods. The first method was salesmanship, selling myself and saying, this is what I do and blah, blah, blah. And wouldn't you just have, rather have one person really concentrating on you and understanding you and photographing rather than 15 monkeys doing the same thing? And people would look at me and say, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe give me a try. So that's how I got in. And eventually, uh, you know, in I started to living in L.A., working for Perry Match. And look, I started to get celebrity assignments because it was Hollywood. And some of my early assignments, I remember, Tuesday Weld, you know, I remember the, the copy said 15 going on 36. You know, now I say I'm 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 16 going on 87. I stole that from Tuesday Weld. One of my early assignments. Well, you're but doing great for 87. I got to tell you, uh, Larry, you're doing great for 87. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. But the short and long of it is that's how I started shooting celebrities. And uh, I'd shoot tennis players, still Beverly Baker flights in Long Beach, various, you know, Tony Trabert. I, I traveled every winter to Australia, to Brisbane, to photograph Davis Cup. Davis Cup was very big in those days. This was before open tennis. And Jack Kramer, when I was in college, hired me because he wanted me to photograph all of the amateur players because he knew he was going to open up tennis pro and he was going to hire all these amateur planner, tennis players. Lou Hode, you know, Ron Labor, you know, all the Pancho Gonzalez, you know, all of them. All the, names I remember, yeah. King, yeah, and, and, and that's Billie why Jean. I'd be flying. And you mentioned Billie Jean King. Is that, I think I Pardon? talked over you, but you, you mentioned Billie Jean King. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I photographed her with Riggs right there in L.A., you know, at the at the stadium where they had the first, you know. War of the Sexes, right? You know, tennis player. I was there. You know? Yeah, at the tennis Astrodome, match. I believe yeah. it was. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it was actually, it was, uh, it was in a, a stadium, uh, which is no longer existing, uh, out there uh, off of 6th Avenue and uh, La Brea. Uh, I remember exactly where it was. I remember the big building was green. Oh. And I got, probably got pictures of it. Gotcha. But nevertheless, uh, my roadway uh, was through sports. And that allowed me celebrity shooting. And I started shooting a lot of celebrities. And, you know, and one day I get a, an, an assignment uh, from Look Magazine, there's a great, great French actor going to make a movie in L.A. He's replacing Maurice Chevalier, the great, great French song and dance man. His name is uh, Yves Montand. Please go out to 20th Century Fox and photograph Yves Montand. Well, I looked it up, you know, not by Google, you know, go through the newspaper in those days. And I saw he was making a movie with Marilyn Monroe. Now, Marilyn Monroe was a bigger star in America than Yves Montand was, but the publication was in France, you see. And Marilyn Monroe wasn't really my assignment, my first assignment. But I remember seeing her when I was in high school or early college on the cover of Time magazine. And I said, wow, if someday I could photograph that woman. Well, now he's going to get a chance. So I went out, Johnny Cook at 20th Century Fox took me out. And I remember Marilyn it was in black tights and she was walking towards her dressing room and Johnny was took me in. And as she was walking up the steps, Johnny Cook said, oh, Marilyn, this is Larry Schiller from Look Magazine. Of course, Marilyn swung around, not because of Larry Schiller, but because of Look Magazine. 
Because you see, in those days, there was no television. There was no entertainment tonight. Magazines were the ways that studios and celebrities or anybody promoted themselves without having to pay for advertising. So here, Marilyn Monroe's going to be photographed by Look Magazine, even though she'd been photographed by some of the greatest photographers in the world and had been on the cover of Photo Play and Modern Screen and all the magazines. And I'd already shot Tony Curtis and Janet Lee and done the first nudes of Jamie Lee Curtis. Of course, she was only six months old when I did those in the swimming pool with her parents, <laughs> you see. So that was how I met Marilyn Monroe. And, and she turned around, put out a house. She says, I'm Marilyn. And I didn't know what to say to her. I really, I was taken back. You know, I'm, I'm just 21 or 22 years old. And I said, oh, I'm the big bad wolf. And she looked at me to show you how smart she was. Oh, you don't look that bad. But when you grow up, you're really going to be bad. That was Marilyn's reply, you see. <laughs> And that's how I got to know Marilyn for about three, four days. And the pictures appeared in Look Magazine and everybody liked them. And I was doing assignments. And what happened in Hollywood at that time, I won't go on too long, was the studios started to hire the top photographers to photograph the movies and submit the pictures or the story ideas to the magazines because they would get better leverage through the photographer than a PR guy calling up the Look Magazine and saying, oh, we got a movie with Eve Montan. How would you like to come out and photograph it? And photographers always came up with unique ways of pitching stories. And I can tell you some stories, if you want, a little later, which were not so good ideas with the movie stars, but great ideas with the magazines. You see? So... That's how I got into being hired by studios. I wasn't the only one. Uh, Elliot Ellisoff and at Life, John Bryson, another great photographer, Bob Willoughby, probably the best. Uh, Steve Shapiro out of Chicago did all the Godfathers. And you'd get to build relationships with the celebrities. That's why I did five movies with Paul Newman. You know, he and I got along very, very well. And, and Elaine May and I got along well. And I remember Howard Koch, the big producer at Paramount, said, I'd like to hire you to photograph Streisand because you got along well with Elaine May and Barbara's maybe more difficult than Elaine May was. Well, that, that's part of and what's interesting about your career, though, Lawrence, is that you parlayed that early success with photography into a lot of different um, channels, let's say. What do you think was the, if you could identify the single most important characteristic that contributed to your success, what would it be? In the motion picture business, we're talking about that period now. I would say the fact that I met an agent by the name of Tom Blau in London, who had an agency called Camera Press, uh, and he represented some of the, about four or five of the greatest photographers in the world. He was very exclusive. He represented Cecil Beaton in London, Yusuf Karsh in Canada, the great portrait photographer. He represented Lord Snowden, Princess Margaret's husband, and a great fashion photographer. And I think one other. But he didn't have a photographer in Hollywood that he represented, you see? So I sent him some of my pictures. I found out about him. And he said, I'd like to represent you. Well, Tom Blau, rep Tom Blau representing you meant that your pictures would appear in magazines all over the world because he was the first photo agency to syndicate in everything from Bangkok to France, Germany, Russia, this, that. And he'd mail, print up, and he'd put them out in the mail in the magazine and get paid if they use them. But that was a valuable asset that I could say to 20th Century Fox. Well, what do you mean? If you hire me, my pictures are gonna appear, chances are if they're good, all over the world because I have an agency. Bob Willoughby didn't have an agent yet, John Bryson didn't. I was the first to think, how do I get my pictures all over the world? And I have to thank Tom Bow. And that's why when 
two years later, when which is another story, which I can tell you, I took some pictures of Marilyn Monroe doing a skinny dip in, you know, something's got to give. He flew to L.A. And I put my mother on an airplane with packages of prints going from country to country, magazine to magazine. And my wife's mother went on another airplane <laughs> delivering the pictures to magazines all over the world because of the arrangement I had made with Marilyn, which I can tell you about. Now, you, um, there's so many different components to your career. Uh, so I want to ask you what you consider to be the turning point. Obviously, when you were young, a really early photographer, when you stopped putting your age in the letters, that was a turning point. But if you look at the broad expanse of your career, is there uh, anything that happened along the way that you considered to be the major turning point that really set you off into a into a direction that was um, that was uh, really led to the the ultimate success you achieved. Well, I would say my relationship with Paul Newman, because in '68 I was photographing either the third or fourth movie with him. Uh, I did from the terrace winning. Um, Butch Cassidy, which we'll talk about, uh, WUSA, you know. And on Butch Cassidy in Qualpa, Mexico, I said to him one day, we were having lunch with John Foreman and Paul. I said, you know, Paul, I'm getting tired. It's just different heads on the same body. And he looked at me and he says, you're convention like an old lady. I said, no, no, you know, look, you know, I'm going to be 30 soon. And it's, you know, he says, well, why don't you start directing films? And I said, Paul, nobody's going to ever hire me to direct a film. Come on. And he threw the script of Butch Cassidy across the table. And he said, read the script, find a scene in it that you want to direct. And I'll tell George Roy Hill, the director, that I'm letting you direct five minutes of the film. Of course, I read the script that night and I couldn't find a scene that I felt I could do something better than George Roy Hill would be doing. But I saw there was something missing from the script. That when they go from the West to Bolivia, the script said, and the bicycle is thrown down and we come in on the wheel, I'm paraphrasing, round and round and round. And it dissolves to the wheel of a train round and round, pulling into the station in Bolivia, the train station. And there we see Paul and Catherine Ross and Barbara Edford. And I said, well, if this film is supposed to be really about real people, they're leaving out something really interesting, and that is the the fact that the characters go to New York to get on a boat to go to Bolivia, because that's the only way you could get there, South America. It's the first time they see the world. They're just, you know, cowboys. And they have to take a train across the United States, and then there's an Easter parade, and then there's Coney Island, and there's Tiffany's Jewelry Store, even in those days. And I said, all these experiences, these characters, where's the scene? Because in those days, you had to wait like a month to get on a boat to go to Bolivia, you see? Gotcha. So I went back to Paul and I said, well, I think here's some scenes missing that you should do. And he said, well, how would you do it? I said, well, it's got to be a montage and this and that and everything else. I said, would you give me a sketch artist? Because I knew all about sketch artists in movies by then, 1968. So he gives me a wonderful sketch artist that I sketch all this out, all these scenes. And he takes it with John Foreman to, to Richard Zanuck Jr. And Zanuck says, well, to do this and this and this and this, you know, and Schiller's going to shoot it. And no, nobody thought it's going to shoot it with a movie camera or whatever. It's going to cost us a quarter of a million dollars. Paul. Paul says, you know, Paul owned the picture with John Foreman. All right, I'll spend the money on Schiller. 
And what I did is I shot all these scenes as still photographs and superimposed them. We didn't have Photoshop in those days. And then cut the images out and pasted them on old photos and airbrushed around it. So you got a picture of, you know, the, the little lake in, in uh, Central Park in New York. And here you got Paul and Joanne, you know, and uh, I'm not putting Paul and Joanne, that comes later. Uh, and Catherine Ross rowing, you understand? Or you got the Easter Parade or a picture in Tiffany. And I had seen in 62 a great montage that Charles Ames, the great designer, had done at the, at the uh, World's Fair in Seattle. So I called up Charles Ames' office and said, can you tell me who the editor was that did that still montage? And they gave me the name and the guy flew down and I hired him. And that's how the seven minute still montage was created that's in the center of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And of course, Paul was kind enough to give me a, a credit for it and everything. Uh, but the short and long of it was, it had a ripple effect. Because over at Paramount, Bob Evans saw that and nobody realized it was done out of still pictures. They thought it was like motion picture footage that was collapsed and made to look like stills. So the next thing is I get a call from Bob Evans that says, we have a movie here that's four hours long and we really only wanted about two hours and 20 minutes. Would you mind coming and taking a look at it? And, uh, you know, Paul Newman's office says that you're very good to work with and et cetera, et cetera. Now, nobody investigated what I had done, but it just said, you know, on the credits. So I went and I looked at this film. It was four hours long. And then they took me to the producer and the owner of the film, who was sitting on a podium with his hair being combed or something by his son, I found. And I look up and I said, well, the problem with this film is, I remember my line exactly. There are too many orgasms and no foreplay. Diana Ross is incredible in the film, but you don't wait wait a minute. You've made a film about a white guy turning on a black woman with drugs, but where's Count Basie in the music? Where's this? Where's that? Well, he says, where did you learn all about it? I said, well, I went and did my research before I went and saw the movie. You expect me to see your movie without knowing the subject a little bit? I was hired for a year and three months on that film. Not only did I direct it and do montages, but I directed new scenes and everything, and then went out on the road. And that's how I got into the movie business. Barry Gordy became my mentor. Barry Gordy of Motown, yeah. Um, so obviously Paul Newman was was key right there. So you end up realizing, hey, I can do this. I, I can get into the motion picture business. I know how to direct. Um, I, why did you? you, you no, your I subject... don't know how to direct. No, no, I don't know how to direct. All I know is how to photograph and make things seem real. And that's very, very key because I never read fiction in my life. I never read history books. So I always, my whole life is dealing with reality. And that has a lot to do with the movies that I start making. But you did direct some movies as well, right? Or TV uh, and miniseries, is that correct? I, 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 of course, but they were all based, except one movie, based on stories I had done. My very first movie was called Hey, I'm Alive, from a Life magazine story I did about a Mormon preacher who got lost in the Yukon for 49 days with a Jewish girl from Brooklyn, Helen Clavin. And I did the movie with Ed Asner and Sally Struthers, my first movie, Hey, I'm Alive. But it's based on a story of mine. My second movie is the same thing, based on a story I did. Because I wouldn't know how to direct a film on a subject I didn't know. I wasn't a director. Well, what about Peter the Great? Now you that's did- the first, That's the first, what happens is follows. And this is very interesting is I start to make films based on things. I, you know, I, I did uh, with Glenda Jackson and Dirk Bogart. You know, I, I did a lot of films based on stories. That was the Patricia Neal story, you know, because I knew Patricia Neal. So what happened was 
Gary Gilmore gets arrested in uh, the early 70s. And, you know, uh, I decide to go to Utah to, to acquire the rights to make a movie. I get ABC to put up the money, $75,000. And, you know, I acquire the rights to write a book and to eventually make a movie. And within a week, I realize that this is a bigger story than just an execution or an execution that's going to come about four months off. You know, the first thing is, how do I break into prison to interview Gary Gilmore? You know, so there has to be a skill to breaking into prison. And after I interview Gilmore for a period of time and a couple other people, all on audio tapes, I realize this is a bigger story than just an execution. So I decide that I'm going to, you know, spend maybe the next six months or nine months in Utah interviewing everybody concerned with the story, the backstory, the history, this, that, and, and everything else. And I start to run out of money. You know, it isn't like I'm a wealthy man. I mean, my wife at that time, we have three kids, you know, got a mortgage and everything else. And, you know, the day rate at that time was $150 a day, photography. You know, space rates were very, very low. So I call up Hugh Hefner because I had sold him some Playboy pictures when I was younger. You know, I did a little bit of that too. And I said, you know, what about an interview with Gary Gilmore that you can publish right after he's executed? And he says, hmm, that's interesting. Well, the short and long of it, I go out and hire a corner man. What's a corner man? Corner man is that when you do interviews, Gilmore, somebody has to read the interviews independently and tell me what I'm missing or what he said that I didn't hear. So I hire a friend of mine by the name of Barry Farrell, who's since passed on, is a very, very fine writer. And he becomes my corner man. Later on, I hire a Pulitzer Prize winning writer to be my corner man. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And so Barry and I do this cut and paste, all of my interviews with Gary Gilmore and a couple other people. And the execution is a couple of weeks off. I send it to Hefner. And it winds up being, at that time, the longest interview that they had ever published in Playboy. Unbelievable. And the, the short and long of it is, you know, Gilmore is executed. I'm the only outsider journalist, if I am, am a journalist, to, to witness the execution. Gilmore has the right to name the five witnesses besides government officials. And he you know, names his uncle, his aunt, his girlfriend who can't come, and myself. And this was by firing squad, correct? Yeah, right. Shot through the heart, as Michael Gilmore, McCall Gilmore wrote. So I then spend another six or nine months interviewing people all over Texas, Utah, everything, that story. 157 interviews. And when I say interview, I don't mean one, two hours. Sometimes I would say to people, I need to interview twice a week, each time for four hours, and it may be six weeks. You see? And 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 in that instance, you know, Barry Farrell is my corner man. And he's reading my interviews. I'm paying him. And he's telling me, oh, maybe you missed this, Larry, or you didn't listen careful enough. You're far from perfect, Larry. And then we get it all together and uh, being dyslexic, I know I can't write this book. I'd already done one book with Albert Goldman, ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Bruce, based on some interviews I had done. So prior to this, I had done a picture book on Marilyn Monroe with 24 photographers on the 10th anniversary of her passing in 72. We're now talking, we're in, you know, in 76. So 
And then I'd done another book with, I'd hired Mailer to write the text. I asked him to write a 15,000 word introduction to the photographs for $50,000. And he wrote 95,000 words <laughs> that was virtually uncuttable. So it wound up being a biography with the photographs. And then John Narr brings me this wonderful pictures of graffiti all over New York. It looks like Miro's and Chagall paintings and everything. Really for the first time showed that urban art was art. So I took it to Norman Mailer and paid him another 50,000 to write 15,000 words. And this time he did, right? But he went out with all the kids in the subways. So I had two books with Mailer. And so I went to Mailer to write, sent him the Playboy interview, a book called The Executioner Song. And Norman spent about a year and ran out of money. And I had to get some additional money. He had to take a life insurance test, a medical test, which got him all upset and everything. And the short and long of it, the book comes out and becomes a long story, becomes a bestseller, wins the Pulitzer Prize. And I then sell the motion picture rights to NBC for a four-hour miniseries. And that wins Tommy Lee Jones. I'm directing and producing. I directed a couple small films. This is my biggest film. But remember, I'm dealing with subjects I know, like the back of my hand. I remember Tommy that. Uh, I remember yeah. that miniseries. I remember Tommy Lee Jones as Gary Gilmore. Yeah. I also remember when I read the Executioner song, there was a scene in there that was probably the most chilling to me. And that is the the murder that he committed. And I believe it was the guy who was at the front desk of the motel. Motel, yeah. And he said, I couldn't have stopped myself if I wanted to. I, he basically described that he was outside of his body and his yeah. his yeah. body was just doing what it was doing and he had no control over it. He was yeah. watching yeah. it all happen. Yeah, well, I, I depict that in a, in a way in the film. And after that, what does he do? Is he goes and buys a six pack of beer and takes it to his uncle as his uncle is watching the police over at the motel. You see? But the short and long of it, because we're going to get to Peter the Great, is that film just runs away with the ratings. It's the first time that a lot of things ever done on television, because my argument with Tartikoff at NBC was this is Mailer's book. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It's fact. I'll tell you why it says a true life novel in a second. And, you know, we can't have a phony beer con sign up there. It's got to say Nick Michelo or Bud Weiser. So we broke a lot of taboos. And, you know, uh, the use of language also, we didn't go as far as they go today on cable, but we went pretty far in those days. And uh, the film comes out, it runs away with the ratings, and I get a telegram from Tartikoff we didn't have email in those days. And it had one line in it. What's next, Larry? <laughs> and what had happened was that day, or the day after, I get a copy of, I had joined many years earlier, the paperback division of Book of the Month Club. And I get this book called Peter the Great, and I don't read, but I thumb through and I come to the beginning of a paragraph and it talks about Peter the Great deciding to have his son executed so that he can preserve his dream of opening up Russia to the West because his son, the heir apparent, would take the country back into religion because his son was very devoutly religious. And I said, well, Jesus, Russia's on the front page of every single newspaper. Ronald Reagan's just called them the evil empire. And we don't know anything about the history of Russia. If they made roots, why don't we make an eight-hour miniseries about the history of Russia? So I discovered that the book had been optioned once by a great, great director, producer, John Milios. So I called John, invited him to lunch at Hamburger Hamlet. 
And he says, you'll never make this film, Larry. Don't spend any money, you know, optioning it again. It can only be made in Russia. You can't make it, you know, it's not like Dr. Zhivago where you can make it in Spain. And I said, uh, well, let me find out a little bit. And uh, I had a very, very good friend, John Price, the photographer, who knew Arm and Hammer. And everybody knew Arm and Hammer was the greatest contact to Russia. He knew Tolstoy and Trotsky and all of them. So I asked to have a lunch or a breakfast with Arm and Hammer, and I flew to London. And Hammer saw me. And he told me how to deal with the Russians, how to make this film in Russia. What I should say, what I should do, who I should associate with, how much money it might cost me, what I should demand for my money. And that goes back, and I'll end this part of it, with something which motivated me very early on. When I, still in college, photographed Anatomy of a Murder with Jimmy Stewart and Lee Remick for the New York Times Magazine, Otto Preminger, while we were playing chess one day, said to me, Larry, if you're going to be successful in the movie business, don't be afraid to surround yourself with people that are more successful than you will ever be. And that's how you'll be successful. And I always followed that. I'd hired the best writers in the world, Norman Mailer. I'd associate Joyce Carol Oates, Norman Mailer. To hire the best cinematographers in the world, Vittorio Storaro, who did The Godfather and all the great films with Bertolucci, to go to Russia with me. I'd give up my directing fees or my producing fees to pay them their higher salaries. And that's what my life was about, succeeding, not necessarily how much money can I make, but how successful can I be? Now, did the USSR uh, get put any money towards the film? You obviously got their cooperation because you spent months there, didn't you? Didn't two you and actually half years. two and a half years? Did you shoot the the uh, mini series there? The whole or... mini series was shot there. It was a year to prepare, a year to shoot, because I wanted all the seasons. Freddie Francis told me it was crazy. We had done that on Executioner Song. Freddie Francis, the great Academy Award winning cinematographer, and and so Storaro came. I mean, just to tell you, how did I get Vittorio Storaro from Italy with everybody to come, his whole crew, everybody to Russia? I didn't send him my script. I didn't send him the movie Executioner Song. You know what I sent Storaro? Three art books, three Russian art books. Vittorio, the first part of the film, I want to, it to look like these type of Russian paintings. The second part of the film, I want it to look like this. And the third part, I wanted to look like Rembrandt's. He told me nobody had ever sent him art books with a vision of a film. But that's but how it, I approached it. It appealed to him. So it worked. Now, did the USSR, I mean, did Yuri Andropov think, look at this and say, you know, this is good propaganda. And I say propaganda in, a, in, a, in the best sense that yeah. let's, let's have the West understand who we are historically oh, and, yeah. and up to today. There's no question. Number one, the first thing is I hired one of the best screenwriters in the world, Edward Anhold, who had won the Academy Award for the Young Lions and everything else. Okay. So here I got Ed's going to get $50,000 to go write a, a treatment. Okay. I got NBC to put up all the money. And then I hired Rudy Petersdorf to handle the business because I'm supposed to be artistic. Okay. And we put together a delegation. Uh, Hammer told me who to contact, what type of translators to bring. And we go to Russia on a, a fact-finding, you know. And I guess we buttered our bread the right way because they liked us. And they said, well, how much are you going to pay us? And I said, well, I want to turn the key once. I don't want to spend a penny more than the cost of going through the door. And it's anything I want for a year. I remember my line that I said to Surikov. I said, if I want 500 soldiers on horseback for a scene of the Streltsy, that's what I want. If I want you to build a wooden Moscow in the city of Suzdal where Tchaikovsky made his films, you know, where the golden coppolas are, I want one key, boom. How much money are you going to pay us? 
I said, how much money do you pay the U.S. for wheat every year? Hammer asked, told me to ask the question because ha Hammer had already told me the answer. And they said, I don't know. I said, I'll give you the same amount of money that you pay for wheat for two years to the United States. And that was $5 million. That's all they were ever paid, $5 million. Now, it cost about $2.5 million more in those days of the Western cruise and this and that and everything else. And the problems, you know, this, that, and everything else. It wasn't an easy show. Don't get me wrong. Now, did Armin Hammer also, who who is the um, uh, former CEO and founder of Occidental Petroleum for our listeners, um, did he also, and, and with with a very strong relationship, as Larry had said, with the people in Russia, uh, he was practically an ambassador, um, an unofficial ambassador to Russia. Right. Um, did he tell you where to eat? Because I suspect two and a half years in Russia, you may have lost weight. Uh, the Russians aren't known for their cuisine. Or did or did were you in places where the cuisine was very good? No, Rush Arm and Hammer taught me something better than the best restaurants. It says find the families that you like and give them a gift of money so they can buy food on the black market, really good food. And they will invite you for lunch, then they'll invite you for dinner, and you can have a routine of every week you go to different people for dinner and so forth. He says, when you give them a gift of money, tell them it's so that they can buy better food on the black market. And that's exactly. Wow. We, yes, we did eat in the Russians. We did stay at the Sovietska Hotel where Hammer told me to stay on Gorky Boulevard. And we did do a lot of the things because I want, you know, would correspond with Hammer a couple more times. But basically, it's not embarrassing the Russians it's working hand in glove. I remember sitting with Andropov after the script, the final script had been given to the Central Committee to be approved. And I was at uh, Yuri Nagibin's home. He's like, he was like the Hemingway of Russia, a great writer, who Andrei Konchalovsky and Nikita Mikolkov, the two great Russian directors that were directed in the West back in those days, introduced me to. And I said to Andropov, well, obviously, this project's projecting, progressing because there must be some trust. And Andropov looked at me through the translator and said, the word trust doesn't exist in my dictionary. <laughs> but I've decided to gamble with you. Now, uh, to gamble. You know, for our listeners, Yuri Andropov, if you're not old enough to remember, Yuri Andropov was the president of Russia short term you know, after yeah. Brezhnev died. I believe it was Konstantin Chernenko came Chernenko. into office and, and then he died very quickly. Then right. Yuri Andropov yeah. comes in. He yeah. died very quickly. And, and that's one of the reasons they, they brought Gorbachev in, because he was young and yeah. they wanted somebody. They, it was embarrassing to see their leaders dropping dead within a, you know, a couple yeah. of three years. Uh -huh. and, I'll and, tell you a story about me and Gorbachev. So Gorbachev invites a thousand people to the Kremlin, all airfare paid from all over the world, Africa, you know, every India, every place, China, every the United States, every country he invites four people. And my film, Peter the Great, had already shown on television, you know, already had already won the Emmy for best miniseries and screenplays and won awards, you know, so forth. And I get invited as one of the four people. I can't believe it. Sitting there, I can understand Gregory Peck being invited. I can understand a member of Congress being invited. And little did we know that this invitation for a thousand people into the Kremlin was where he was going to announce Perestroika. And, <clears throat> and I remember sitting in the Kremlin and Sakharov, who was just released from internal exile, is sitting like three rows behind me next to Gore Vidal. And it was just, I couldn't believe it. Here, Larry Schiller is with all these really world legends, you know, and I'm there because I convinced them to make Peter the Great. And Graham Greene gets up to introduce Gorbachev and says the only thing he wants is Gorbachev to allow there to be an ambassador from the Vatican. 
And I didn't even understand that. I didn't realize that Graham Greene was that devout a Catholic and that the Vatican, which is like a separate nation, didn't have an ambassador to Russia Hmm. at that time. So Gorbachev makes this entire speech announcing Perestroika. And then all of us go into the grand, grand hall where they've set up all these tables for a thousand people to have dinner. And I, we walk up to the tables, everybody, and the tables are this high and there's no chairs. <laughs> and everybody is standing by the tables and some people are relaxed. They must know what it's all about. I didn't. And all of a sudden, Gorbachev comes into the room and I turn to the translator at the end of the table. Every table had a translator. And I said, why aren't we sitting down for dinner? And she says, well, President Gorbachev, when he greets everybody at every table, does not want you to have to get up from your chair when he shakes your hand. He wants you already standing. (laughs) That's why there were no chairs. And we all sat, stood for dinner. And then I asked Gorbachev when he came to the table, well, Mr. President, what did you think of Peter the Great? Maybe you've seen a little bit or it's been reported to you. And he gave me one of the great political answers. Mr. Schiller, there's nothing in it that I think we're ashamed of. That's all he said. <laughs> very, very, like very. It, didn't like it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you about Norman Mailer, because you guys didn't, you know, Norman Mailer always fascinated me. He lived uh, like uh, like you, a really interesting life. Um, he wasn't always easy to get along with, to say the least. And I think you had right. your moments with him. And when I read his biography, Tough Guy, uh, there was a scene in there where they said, where you were having a, an argument with him and That's said Mike to Lennon's him. biography you're talking about? Which, which one again? You said a, a Mailer biography. Is yeah. that Mike Lennon's? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think he was the author. I'd have to go back and check. Whoever it is, I, doesn't matter. I think it's the most recent one. But I got to tell you that there was a scene where you were arguing. It had to do with Marilyn Monroe. And he, you supposedly said to him, what do you know about Marilyn Monroe? I, at least I slept with her. I fucked her. You did. That's what I said to him. Oh, you said that to him. No, you never were even you, fucked her. Were you, pl- were you uh, just poking him in the eye or did you I'm have intimacy in the with- eye. i didn't say oh, i okay. slept with her i said you've never even fucked her how would you know <laughs> uh what was that argument about anyway do you recall i don't recall at all but you know mailer lived not far from maryland at one point in brooklyn heights and he always wanted to write about her which i didn't know you know and uh you know he he did write something you know actually i had two choices to write the the text for that book and i wanted somebody very very controversial because i wanted the cover of life magazine and time magazine and the atlantic and ladies home journal i wanted all the magazines this is the 10th anniversary of maryland's death 1972 24 of the world's greatest photographers from avidon to you know bert stern you name it have come together to do this book And there were only two writers in the world that I came to my mind in a meeting. And one of them was Gloria Steinem and one was Norman Mailer. I'd never read Gloria Steinem and I'd never read Norman Mailer. But they were the type of people that get you on the cover of a magazine. Mm -hmm. I turned to Bob in uh, at Grosson and Dunlap, Bob Markell. And so what do you think of Gloria Steinem? And he said, well, let me think. And he walks out of the room, comes back 10 minutes later. He says, you got Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer didn't even know for six months he was going to do the book. <laughs> Scott Meredith, his agent, had closed the deal because Norman owed him money. And this was his way of getting $50,000 back towards the money that Norman owed him. So Norman starts by being hired to write 15,000 words, and that's why he delivered 95,000. <clears> because he doesn't write introductions. He got tired of writing essays, you know, when he was at Harvard. Now, um, 
you met Marilyn. Uh, the, for, there was that first shoot you described uh, when you first met her, and the the words you know, the, "I'm the big bad wolf" came out of your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Two two years later, you saw her again, and I believe yeah. you said that she was a really. You could just see that she was really troubled. Well, what happened in those days? We were being hired, as I said, by the studios for a lot of money, and we would go through the script and then discuss with the star what scenes we would shoot because you're not going to be, if a movie shoots for 40 days, you're not going to be paid to be on the set every day for 40 days. <coughs> so I went up to Marilyn's house in uh, Brentwood, the house that she tragically dies in some, several months later, and to go through the script with her to discuss which scenes I'm going to photograph. And Pat Newcomb is over by the window there. And we discuss, oh, I want this with Wally Cox. I like him. He's funny. I said, but funny doesn't show up in pictures, Marilyn. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she said, oh, you want the scene, which is splish splash, where I jump in the swimming pool with a newt bathing suit on. I said, well, yeah, that's a good scene because it'll look like you got nothing on. And she said, well, I'll jump in with the newt bathing suit. But what would happen if I came out with nothing on, Larry? She didn't say it that strongly. I'm dramatizing the moment. And I said, you got a big problem, Marilyn, really a big problem. You're already famous. Now you're going to make me famous. And she looked at me and leaned over. Don't be so cocky, Larry. I can fire you in two seconds. Of course, she didn't <laughs> fire me. And that's, you know, how Marilyn and I worked in those days. I had built a certain amount of relationship with her. I won't say I was a friend. I was a business associate. I could deliver magazine covers all over the world. And she was fighting with 20th Century Fox. She finally gets fired on the movie, you know, and then tries to renegotiate the contract. I had no idea at that time about, you know, the, the problems that she was having in her life. Talk a little bit about the Kennedy assassination. You know, it's. I guess what I'm asking is not just about the Kennedy assassination. Between Marilyn and the Kennedy assassination, the photographs you got, you got, you know, some of the most iconic photographs that have uh, ever ever taken of those two um, individuals and situations. Um, what is it? And I know that you downplay your skill as a photographer. You say, I'm not the greatest photographer. I'm not the greatest this. I'm not the greatest that. Um, but you delivered on the photography. There's no question about that. What does it take? To I'll tell you what it takes. Yeah. Very, very simple. And I learned it in junior high school, shooting sports, anticipation, not what you see now, but what's going to happen two seconds later. Anticipation and being ready for it, prepared for it and being ahead of it. The minute Marilyn Monroe said to me in her house, what happens if I jump in with the bathing suit on but come out, out with nothing on? I'm already anticipating everything that's going to take place. And on this set, I'm anticipating every moment that I can shoot in between the camera roll. But the success, whether it's you look at the video footage, not video, 16 millimeter footage of the Kennedy assassination at the police station, you can see all the press with all the cameras in that direction, photographing the gun, you know, being held high. And then you see in the corner of the frame, Larry Schiller in the background going around the back and looking, he's got three Leicas on him and he lifts one of them and he's waiting. And then you click, you see him click the shutter and he turns and walks away. Actually, I clicked the shutter about three, four times. I was anticipating the moment. And the moment the story was that gun that the whole world was going to see through the, those photographers. So the silhouette of that gun in the air is the story. And, and Oswald, I wanted to feel the pores on his skin. So I used the 21 millimeter lens to get him close. There's video footage of him coming out of the elevator for the very first time. And Larry Schiller is the closest person to Lee Harvey Oswald. And he's not using flash. Everybody else is using flash because they got to make a newspaper deadline, the Associated Press, United, you know, television didn't exist. There was one television camera at the end of the hallway on a tripod. 
filming everything live, broadcasting. It was the first time that live broadcasting ever took place. But there's a story of mine behind my appearance there, which is, I think, very important. A month before, I'd been assigned by Perry Match to photograph Madame Nu. She was the dragon lady of Vietnam. And while she was in the United States, her brother-in-law, I believe it was, was assassinated by the CIA in Vietnam. And she became a woman that couldn't even pay her hotel bills because there was no government behind her anymore. Without getting into all the details on how I, you know, integrated myself into her life and flew to Rome, to the Vatican with her and everything through Sweden and everything was in a convent with her when she was reunited with her children, photographing it all for Parry Match and all the magazines. And I flew back to the United States when that story was over, this first of November in 63. And I'm in the shower when my wife comes running in. I heard on the radio, Kennedy's been shot, Kennedy's been shot. And I'm out of the shower. I grab my camera bag. I throw a shirt in the camera bag, no suitcase. I get in the goddamn car to drive to LAX airport because I got to be in Dallas. And what's in my mind the whole trip to Dallas, I mean, to the airport, that this death of Kennedy is a retaliation for what he did in Vietnam through the CIA. That's what's in my mind, you see? Because I just covered another major event surrounding the assassination in Vietnam at the beginning of November, the same month. And of course, LAX at that time was the closest airport to Dallas. San Francisco's further away, Chicago's further away, New York, Miami. Atlanta didn't have the news bureaus until CNN went into business, so it didn't exist. And of course, all the media is on that plane. And how we got there in three hours, on the plane, the captain actually tells everybody that Kennedy has died. Because you have to remember, he's shot, and it's not for two hours later that it's publicly announced that he's died. And then how we get, I don't even remember how I got from the airport to the police station and got to the second or third floor. Only five, 10 minutes before Oswald having been arrested for the Tippett murder of a police officer is brought out of the elevator. And there you see me with my three Leicas and my 21 millimeter lens because I want to feel the pores of the skin on Oswald's face. And he, his face is beat up, right? in that image. Yeah, there's a black and blue uh, where he was hit in the theater, I believe, uh, and uh, and so forth, you know. Now, um, let, let's switch to O.J. Simpson for a minute. You wrote a book called American Tragedy. L.A. Times called it the best book on the subject uh, that had been written. New York Times called it extraordinary. And um, remember, it was called the, the trial of the century. Uh, it was such a big trial. The whole country was riveted. Now, another person covering that at the time was Dominic Dunn. Did you know Dominic Dunn? Very, very well. I knew Dominic for years. So he, um, I guess I have a couple of questions around that. Did did Norman Mailer come to you about Simpson and say, hey, let me let me collaborate with you on this? Did he want a piece of that? And, no, there's, uh, a, there, go there's ahead. interesting stories. Number one, to understand my involvement with the Simpson case, you have to understand that 20, 30 years earlier, I lived on Elville Drive. And one day my daughter runs into the house on Sunday and her hand is all bleeding. I said, what happened? What happened? And she says, well, I fell and I cut myself on the street. He threw me a long one and I missed. I said, what, what do you mean a long one? She says, well, I was playing football with O.J. Simpson. Now I knew O.J. lived up the street with his first wife, but I didn't know on Sunday because I'd sleep late with my wife that all the kids would run out at seven in the morning and he'd be playing football with the kids on the street. So indirectly, that's how I meet the Simpson family. But I don't really meet OJ. I meet OJ's first wife, this, that. Then years later, through another series of circumstances, I become very friendly and a business partner with a gentleman by the name of Robert Kardashian. 
who has a beautiful wife and is maybe going to get a divorce and this and that. And he wants to do a, a 30th birthday video. And, you know, I'm now making films. So, Larry, I got Randy Newman's music track. Randy sent it to me because Robert was in the music business. And he says, let's drive all around Beverly Hills and go into all the stores, photograph everybody. Instead of saying, I love L.A., let's say, I love Chris. I love this. I love that. So we made this music video. And Robert charters a plane for Chris's 30th birthday, I think it was, from L.A. to Las Vegas and premieres the thing on the plane, the video. Well, it becomes, you know, very, very interesting and a very famous video eventually. And so I am I know Robert very, very well. Then Robert and Chris, you know, gets divorced and she, she eventually marries Bruce Jenner. And Robert and I are still in touch. You know, we do things. And one day, you know, I, I see on television, Nicole's been killed, OJ's in Chicago, and they're trying to get him back, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The news headlines. I get a phone call from Robert Kardashian. Robert, yeah, what's what's happening? Nobody knows, but uh, I got to talk to you about OJ. Well, I knew OJ was one of his friends, close friends, maybe his best friend from SC. Well, I'll meet you by the 405 freeway on the underpass where all the noise of the cars are. Because if the police are watching you already, even with a parabolic microphone, they won't be able to pick up what you and I are going to talk about. So on this big ramp by the 405 freeway in Sepulveda, Robert and I are there. And he says, Larry, I don't know what to do. The press is going to be on my back. OJ is going to hide out in my house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, we got a bigger problem. All of OJ's money is tied up in pension plans and in condos here and there. He's only got like $300,000, $200,000 in cash. I'm, the lawyers want a lot of money and they're going to want more. Because Robert was a lawyer. I said, well, you're going to have to figure out. He says, I'm going to go to Brentwood savings in a couple of days, see if I can get a second mortgage on the house. Well, the short and long of it is, OJ comes back, hides out in Robert's house, and does the slow speed Bronco chase, you know, gets mm -hmm. arrested, you know, all that. And he starts getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of letters in jail. So one day I go up to Robert's house, OJ's already in jail. And I see all these sacks of mail all by the front door. I said, Rob, what's all these men? Oh, this is what the police won't take any of these. He's got his cell already filled up. I said, what's in here? He says, oh, these are letters. OJ. I said, will you open them? He says, yeah, some of them. We open them up and some of them have money. Some of them have Bibles. Some of them even have knives in them. And he says, but I got to talk to you. We need a million and a half dollars. And Brentwood won't give me the loan. What do you think? What 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 should we do? I don't want to sell stock. I looked at the mail and I said, oh, I got your million and a half dollars. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to call Charlie Hayward that did Executioner Song at Little Brown. And you get me in to interview OJ in jail. And we're going to do a book in which he answers all these letters. We're going to break them down by subject index by subject, the ones that have to do with marriage, the ones that have to do with spousal abuse, religion, this, that. And OJ is going to write a book that will publish before the trial starts. Because nobody knew when the trial was going to start. And I'll get a million and a half dollars advance for you. And that afternoon, I called Charlie Haywood. And he guaranteed me the million and a half, and he flew to LA the next day to look at the letters. I then hired a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Dave Johnson, a very famous writer now on television, teaches in Rochester, Ed Guthman, Bobby Kennedy's aide in the Justice Department, introduced me to Dave Johnson. Dave starts organizing all the letters for me, and he becomes my corner man. And I go in 
and I interview OJ for like 30 hours, over 16 visits. And we publish a book called I Want to Tell You by OJ Simpson. And it was his answers to the letters. Now, that book brought in about $5 million in royalties very, very quickly. But I had a contract to do that book. And the contract said that when the trial was over, irrespective of innocence and guilt, if OJ didn't write a book, if he did write a book, I had to have the option to write it like I did, I want to tell you, edit it, my interviews of him. If he didn't write it, then I had the right to write my own book without any obligation of any way, any part, financial approval or anything to O.J. Simpson. Now, I knew something that his lawyer, Skip Taft, didn't know. And that was that he could never write a book. You know why? Because all the money under California law at that time would go to the victims. And his ego wouldn't allow him to write a book with the money going to the victims mm -hmm. if he was judged innocent or guilt. That's how American tragedy came about. And I paid every single lawyer that I interviewed $400 an hour to be interviewed. I didn't want them to waste their time because they were going to write their own books, Cochran, everybody else. I saw Sean Chapman just the other day uh, at a tribute for Roz Wyman in L.A. She's now married. Beautiful woman. And, you know, I interviewed all the lawyers. And that's how American tragedy. And then what happened? I realized that I had the whole backstory because I was involved with the defense with Kardashian. I was interviewing the lawyers. But I didn't have anything in the courtroom because I wasn't sitting in the courtroom. I was working the back end, the defense. Mm -hmm. So I went to Dave Johnson. Originally, I went to David Margulis. And Vanity Fair wouldn't let him do it. And then I went to Dave Johnson and asked him if he would collaborate and he would write the parts of the book that have to do with what happened in the courtroom. And I would write everything that happened outside of the courtroom. When I say write, I'm dyslexic. I can't write, but I can dictate like I'm talking to you. I can tell a story. And a long time earlier than that, uh, or around that time, Tina Brown wanted me to start to learn how to write. And I told her I couldn't. And she said, don't worry, I'm going to give you Gore Vidal's editor. So I had the best editors in the world. I had Norman Mailer's editor help me on American Tragedy, Jason Epstein. And when I did other books, I once I had Gore Vidal's editor and so forth. So it's the same thing that Otto Preminger said. If you're going to be successful, surround yourself with successful people, Larry, people more successful than you will ever be. And that's what I'm all about. Tell me about Dominic Dunn. What was your relationship like with him? And how did you, did you meet him because you were both covering the OJ case or did you know him long before then? Well, number one, it was a love-hate relationship at the beginning. He respected me, but he wrote this column in Vanity Fair, which had to be always on the edge, criticizing or making fun of, or, you know, but Dominic was such an ethical guy. He'd tell me in front, I'm going to say this about you. Don't get upset. Very few writers would do that. And when he started to write his fiction book about the Simpson case, I'm going to call you a double agent. And of course, when I got engaged to, you know, after I had a divorce, so to my current life at that time, Dominic Dunn was at the party, you know, Newsweek, everybody all celebrating that I was getting engaged. Dominic and I were very, very close uh, up to the time of his his passing, you know. So a lot of times when you see something where one journalist criticizes another, sometimes I'm not saying it's planned. What I'm saying is the writer or the journalist involved doing the criticizing always gives the other guy a heads up. You know, As a what? courtesy. Because he doesn't want to be surprised himself someday. Right, right. You know, I see you have a photograph of you with Tom Wolf, the the great uh, author as well. Uh, did you have a uh, friend a friendship with Tom Wolf as well, or was that a one off? In 1966, I did a big essay for Life magazine uh, called uh, uh, on LSD, the indiscriminate use of LSD cover story, 
I think it was 12 pages or something. And then I decided I wanted to do a book out of it. And I went to Clay Felker. And Clay didn't want to do it. He was running New York Magazine at that time. But I didn't know that behind the scenes, Tom Wolfe had seen my essay in Life Magazine, which had inspired him to go to San Francisco to do electric Kool-Aid acid test. And that's how Tom and I built our relationship. And years later, we redid electric Kool-Aid acid test for Toshin with photographs by me and another photographer. And so uh, with, with a publisher by the name of Toshin, I've done a lot of books with some very, very fine writers in which I've brought journalism from the second half of the 20th century with photography of the second half of the 20th century. We're running long. Am I not? So well, we are, right. but I have a few more questions for you if you can okay. spare the time. I'm sorry. I'm no, no, that's too much. fine. Apologize. This is it's it's interesting. I gotta, I gotta uh, learn to shut my mouth. It's interesting stuff. Um, let me ask you. I, I'm curious about process. Um, how do you start your day, and how do you you end your day? Good question. Every morning I get up around eight, seven thirty or eight. I come right to this computer and I pay all the bills. I don't want to drop dead and my wife have to worry about unpaid bills. That's the first thing every single day. And if I don't have enough money to pay all the bills, I have a little line of credit that I borrow from the bank for a week and then pay it back. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second thing I do every morning is I answer all the emails that have come in overnight from all around the world. And that's the second thing. And then I go shower and shave. I didn't shave this morning, but I did do my beard. I think I combed my hair. Uh, and the short and long of it is that's how I start each day. And then I get into now, if I'm going to do a project, this is running a business. But if I'm going to do a project, I'm not here. I don't exist. I go off someplace miles away. Now, I haven't done a project, major project in the last 15 years. I've been managing the projects I've done. But in the old days, and that's what my first wife, rightfully so, got very upset. I'd go away for a year. Or every day, every week, I'd go from Monday to Friday, halfway around the country or the world, and come back to be on weekends. I just didn't exist. Now, I had an office. I had a secretary. I had somebody. I had an accountant, a bookkeeper at that time. You know who else worked like you in that regard is a guy named, who you might know, Sidney Sheldon. When he would work on a novel, he said he, he'd go to some place, I don't know, a cabin or whatever. He wouldn't read anything else because he didn't want to be influenced by anything else. He'd completely immerse himself in yeah. the task at hand and then turn out, of course, he turned out one bestseller after another. Yeah. Did you did you know Sidney Sheldon? I met him just once. But, you know, it's the same thing. You know, my agreements with Norman Mailer on the five books that we did together based on my interviews is I didn't have the right to edit his books, but I had the right to review them and make serious suggestions. And I remember when he sent me Executioner's Song, the first draft, I had to get on an airplane and fly halfway around the world to isolate myself to read it. And then there was another book I checked into the Beverly Hills Hotel in L.A., and locked myself in a room to read it. Because you have to understand I'm dyslexic. And I got to read very, very slow. And sometimes I don't even understand what's being written. And I'm only looking for the facts. I'm not looking for the literature. Because I wouldn't know. I'm being honest with you. A good Norman Mailer book from a bad Norman Mailer book. But you knew the facts. You did the research. You pulled it together and you knew the facts. Yeah. I'm not saying Norman didn't do some of the research on the books that we did. I'm not saying he didn't follow up to double check what I had sent him. You know, he's an esteemed journalist, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, in his passing, you know, N Norris Mailer, his wife, asked me to be the literary executor of his estate. And with Mike Lennon, his biographer, you know, we for three, four, five years, you know, we did everything. And then I started the Norman Mailer Center for writers, you know, the, you know, all, all over the world, writers came and taught and for summers, and we did that for 10 years, you know. I enjoy challenges. I want to do things that nobody else has done. And hopefully I can do them, you know, in a way that somebody else wouldn't do. 
Is there, tell us one that got away. What was a project that you wanted that, that, that slipped through your hands? That I really wanted. And I'm sorry, I'm sure there are a lot I can give you, but right now it's hard to come to my mind. I mean, some difficult ones, you know, like Robert Hansen was very difficult, the Russian mole and the FBI. And, uh, you know, Mailer and I, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you how I got that, to be very frank with you. What happened was uh, Robert had Hansen had a car which was given to him by the government, which the family used. He had, you know, a government car. And when he was caught, the first thing they did is take the car away. And Bonnie, his wife, didn't have a car. Now, one of his sons was already married and the daughter wasn't. I have to be very frank with you. I went out and bought a car and sent her the car. That's how I ingratiated myself into the Hanson family. Wow. So she, she started cooperating. Now you might call, he you might call that you might call that bribery. You might call it uh payola. But I knew that was the one thing that probably they needed more than silence. Now, let me get back to your work day. You told us how you start the day when you're not working on a big project. Like right now, I don't know that you're in the middle of a big project. How would you end your typical day, your typical work day? By telling my wife, thank you for sharing your life with me. Oh, there you go. I'm That's almost it. every day or every couple of days, there's a moment at the end of the day when we sit down together and have dinner and she tells me about her day and I tell her about my day. And at some point during that, I look at her and I say, thank you for sharing your life with me. What is going to be your, your next big project? Do you know yet? Well, Can you say? for the last couple of years, I've been databasing major archives for some very important people uh, without naming some of the clients. But right now, I'm doing an archive of over 13,000 documents uh, on slavery from 1577 to 1920, all collected by one man. And we've been working a year and a half. I have six people on it. Uh, we've been databasing and photographing all these historical documents, some of them virtually falling apart. And they were brought to me. And, and I, I, I do Ingrid Rockefeller's archives. I do a lot of photographers' uh, archives, Jacques Lowe's archives I did for his family. So, you know, I started databasing my own work some 25 years ago when databasing at home was just possible on small computers. Uh, and I built with programmers a very, very important database that I provide. And I have a list of clients that uh, I work for and people come to me all the time with major archives. Uh, sometimes they're photographs and sometimes they're historical documents. So that's the business I've been in for the last five or six years. Gotcha. So, um, you know, uh, we've covered so much ground. There's so much more ground to cover, really. Uh, I, I guess I'll ask you just one more, Larry, and that is uh, I, I heard you referred to as Zelig-like. The, the movie, for those of you who are listening, not familiar with the movie Zelig, it's a Woody Allen movie. He's a man who really basically turns into his environment. Whatever the people are he's with, he turns in, into that type of person. Um, so that kind of shape-shifting uh, this person was indicating was key to your success, that you understood the people involved, you understood the situation, and you acted accordingly. Now, you just gave an example of that, really, uh, with uh, uh, Bonnie Hansen and his uh, Robert Hansen's car is taken away, obviously impounded as evidence. Uh, she doesn't have a car. You you give her a car uh, to use. You buy her a car. But no um, strings attached. No strings attached. No, you didn't say in return, but obviously you ingratiated yourself, as you said. And when you were looking to talk to Robert and to, to Bonnie, they were amenable. Not Robert. Robert couldn't talk to me, but his kids and his and his son-in-law and his daughters and Members of the family, good. Got you. Okay. So, I mean, do you relate at all to that kind of uh, uh, the the analogy of, of uh, Zelig? Well, I don't think so. 
I, I, I don't think just because I've been at different places, I can tell you a lot of places I haven't been in. I, 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 I never got an assignment to go to Vietnam, which just kills me. I never got a good civil rights assignment, even though I photographed the Watts riots and Dr. King uh, and so forth. But I really feel, you know, like Steve Shapiro, one of the great, great civil rights photographers. Uh, I never got, so I, I feel I was left out of a lot of historic events in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, so those are the ones did, that got away. Some of those uh, got away. It wasn't specific, but you would have liked to have ha had an assignment in Vietnam yeah, at, at some point. Of course. I mean, in, in civil Burroughs, rights. And Larry Burroughs for Life did such incredible pictures. Unbelievable. You know, I'd sit and I'd look at Life magazine and his stuff and I'd say, fuck, when is somebody going to give me an assignment so I could go and, you know, try it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, hey, one final, uh, Larry, uh, my understanding is that when you have a, a project, you insist on total control for everybody out there who wants to be Lauren Schiller uh, or is doing uh, the sort of work that you've done in the past. Why uh, talk about the importance of having total control? And did you have to walk away from some of them because they said, well, that's not going to happen because I have to have the final, uh, you know, the subject said I have to have the final word on it. There's a finish line when you're running the 100-yard dash or the 50 yards in the Melrose games, and you have your eye on the end. And like a 100-yard or a marathon runner, you don't want people, as you're running the race, to give you advice what to do. That's why I want total control. I may be wrong in what I'm doing. I may not be doing it right. But I have a finish line in sight, and I know how I want to get there and what I feel I need to accomplish to get to the finish line. And I'm not always right. And I maybe could have done it better. And there are projects that I have, I can't remember which ones, but failed on. Okay? There are, you know, I had a relationship with Marina Oswald. She used to come to California with her kids and vacation with my wife and my kids. But yet when it came to the John F. Kennedy centennial in 2017, in 2015, it was the Kennedys that hired me to curate the Smithsonian exhibition on JFK and to produce opening night and to do the book for Harper Collins with Stephen Kennedy Smith and Doug Brinkley, because I had a vision, a finish line, and I remember sitting with the curator at the Smithsonian who does all it. And he got him and walked out and said, you want to do it? Go. You'll fall flat on your face. But I knew the color of the walls I wanted painted behind. I knew I wanted all the pictures to be the same size that they would be in the 60s and the late 50s. I had a vision. And luckily, it came off. And, and now I'm doing Bobby Kennedy's centennial in a couple of years. Wow. Okay. Well, Lauren Schiller, this has been um, just a delight. I really appreciate you taking the time. This is the longest podcast I think I've done since uh, I talked to Gay Talese, a guy he's, you might know. By the way, he's a brilliant, brilliant, he's, biller, brilliant writer. Isn't he? He wrote sports for the New York Times like nobody could write sports. Yeah, he was. he's amazing. He was, I used uh, to definitely... sit in California as a teenager and get the newspaper. By the way, that's what I send all my grandchildren. I send them newspaper prescriptions for the first year. I want them to have the tactile feeling of reading something. Yes. Yes. Larry, thanks a million for your time. Yeah. Send me a copy of this saying, so put it in my archive. I will do it. Thank you.